Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father in heaven, what a beautiful day you have gifted us. The smell of fresh air that we have not smelled in months. The ability to be back in this space, to worship, to praise, to express our gratitude, and to receive from you. And as we open your word, we ask that you would speak and that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. One of the things that I have discovered in life is that there is a desire in the hearts of many people in this world for power, prestige, and the other thing is privilege. Power, prestige, and privilege. We long for more we long to have more, we long to be seen by other people as powerful people. The kind of people that when you walk into a room, people notice. And the challenge with this is that it can lead us in ways that are far away from the heart of God and how he intends for us to live in this world. And so today we're going to look into this reality a little bit. We're going to attempt to listen to the words of Jesus that speak into this situation and to seek to receive what Jesus is telling us. This is part five in a series that we have been engaged in over many, many weeks. And we have been looking at the words of Jesus, listening to try to actually hear what Jesus is saying, sometimes in ways that cut across the grain of how we normally operate, of how the world around us operates. We have found out who the favored people are in week one, not often the people that we think the poor in spirit, the merciful, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Jesus said these are the favored people, not the people that are on TV, not the people who have more money than our minds can actually fathom. The people that God favors is this specific group of people. In week two, we found that God intends for people that are called by his name to not just love people who love them back, not just to love those who are easy to love, but to love even their enemies, which was completely countercultural in Jesus' day. In week number three, we looked at how to be a good neighbor. Not so much who is my neighbor, because that was not the most important element. The most important element, according to Jesus, is how we behave as neighborly people. Regardless of the other person, regardless of some kind of characteristic about them, the emphasis was on the person being neighborly to others. That was that story of the Good Samaritan. And then last time we were together, we looked at God's house, the place where God would be worshipped, the place where people would gather together to connect with God, to express their gratitude, to receive forgiveness. God's house had always been an intention going forward that one day it would be a place 
of prayer, a place where people would come to seek after God and find him, a place of prayer not for a small and select group of people, but Jesus said a place of prayer for all people. And Jesus was actually just quoting from the Old Testament as he described that vision that God had for places that would bear his name. And that this is really the kinds of things that are meant to be fused, if you will, born inside of us so that we live out the character of God in this world. Today, as we look into another text to listen to Jesus, I want to invite you, if you have a Bible with you, since the words will not be up on the screen, uh, digital device, paper, whatever you have with you, whatever translation, open it up to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And we're going to begin in verse 20, and we'll be reading 20 to 23. We'll talk a little bit, and then we'll move on to a few extra verses after that. Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 20. We are coming down to the end of Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Matthew when we have these words in this situation take place. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Who are the two people, uh, aside from Zebedee's wife, who is likely uh, a relation to Jesus, who are the two individuals that come with uh, what is likely Salome in this, uh, in this text? Who are the other two individuals here in the story? James and John. Do you remember what Jesus had called them earlier on in the gospel? Sons of thunder, slightly passionate people, maybe we could say, a little bit outspoken maybe. Uh, they were very uh, protective of Jesus' honor and wanted to, in one instance, bring down fire from heaven to burn people up because they had offended Jesus, at least they thought that Jesus was offended. He was disrespected, and so they wanted the Father to, to send fire down and burn people up, and Jesus gave them the nicknames Sons of Thunder. It's interesting how that changed over time. But these two sons, these two brothers, if you will, show up with their mom, and what, are the th what, what, what is it that they are longing for? Prestige, power, and privilege. They want to be on either side of Jesus, whom they believe is about to be crowned as Messiah King over the nation, and all of these amazing things are about to take place, we want to have the highest positions of authority next to Jesus when the kingdom of God comes. Power, privilege, and prestige. 
as Messiah's uh, influence and as his prestige would grow, what would happen to theirs? It would grow commensurate to his. And they, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, their mom brings them. Maybe just a little extra assistance. Like, hey, maybe if we're family by some, some angle here, maybe mom can have a little bit more influence in this. And it's interesting that Jesus addresses James and John. Salome is there, but he addresses James and John because they want this. It's not just that Salome wants it for them. They want this. So we have this longing within them for power, prestige, and privilege, but there's something else that we have to take into consideration. It's not just that, because seldom is the human experience totally black and white. It's often gradations. Things are intermingled. So if you remember, John has this desire to be in proximity to who all the time? Jesus. He wants to get close to Jesus. When there's a meal to be had, where does he want to sit? He wants to sit right next to Jesus. When something important is going on, he wants to be a part of it and often is invited in. And it's not just that John is is vying for position and power. There is actually a longing in John to be close to Jesus because he respects and loves him. He sees who Jesus is and his heart is drawn to him as the Messiah. I mean, wouldn't you want to be close to somebody like Jesus? John did. James did. John was just always trying to get as close as he could. That's what the Gospels tell us. And so we have this this mingled situation, privilege and power and prestige and respect and love. And Jesus recognizes the competing things that are going on inside of them. You don't know what you're asking. If we back up just a couple of verses, what's interesting is the context into which the story comes from. Let's back up just a couple of verses. If you are still in Matthew chapter 20, let's take a look at verses 17 through 19. If you're taking notes, Matthew 20, 17 through 19. Now, Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. That is the final event up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, so this is Jesus and the disciples, one of those rare moments when he has just the 12 of them together, and he's going to share something very important that is about to happen. He has told them this before, but he is saying it again because this is the final journey up to Jerusalem before his passion. Verse 18, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Who would that be? Who's going to mock and flog Jesus? The Romans. We'll hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Jesus has just told them that it is not a throne that awaits him in Jerusalem. It is death at the hands of the church, if you will. The instigators being the church, the Romans are the people that have to actually bring it to pass. But this is where Jesus is headed. This is what's going to happen. It's not prestige and power and privilege, it is a cross. And it is in that context that Jesus has Salome and James and John show up and say, hey, 
Do you remember those thrones you had talked about at one point? We want to be on those with you. We don't know what this other stuff was you were talking about. We like the throne thing. That's what we want. And since we don't understand all the rest of that stuff, would you let us have those places of power with you? What did they believe was about to happen? The crowning of Messiah is king. They believed that the kingdom of God was about to come physically, which meant their enemies would be wiped out, the nation of Israel would be restored, and they would have power once again as a nation. And where were they going to be in all of that? At the top with Jesus. Jesus had just said, before thrones and crowns, there's a cross. And they didn't want to hear it. Are we really that different? I don't think so. We want these things. We want being a follower of Jesus. We want everything to work out. We want Jesus to give us everything we want, all the good stuff. Can we have a little more power? Can we have a little more prestige? Can we have a little more privilege? And Jesus says, before the crown, there's a cross. And the human heart rebels against that. So what had Jesus been telling them? Listen to just these words. I won't ask you to turn to them, but if you're taking notes, I'll list off the verses for us. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 12. Let's just hear a couple of things that Jesus had been saying up to this moment. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Who's blessed? The persecuted. Does Jesus promise that everything is going to be paved and easy here? No, he doesn't. Matthew 10, 38 and 39 Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Does that sound like power and prestige and privilege to you? No. A cross, Jesus said, is meant to be taken up. And for each person, that's going to be unique to their circumstance and situation. Before the crown, there is a cross. Not just for Jesus, but for Jesus' followers as well. Metaphorically, most of the time, there were a few people, Peter being one of those, who actually experienced the cross physically as a follower of Jesus. And this whole idea about losing your life to find it, like, no, thank you very much. I want to keep things the way I like them. I want what I want. Jesus says, you will find true life when you are willing to surrender it over to me. It doesn't sound like power and privilege and prestige. And then this one. Matthew 18, 1 through 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, do you ever notice that the questions people ask are really windows into what's going on in their soul? Listen to this one. Matthew chapter 14, excuse me, chapter 18, verses 1 and 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Because we hope that it's going to be us. So let us know. What, let us know. Let's see if we're on the right track. And then Jesus does something they could have never imagined. 
Verse 2, he calls a little child to him and placed the child among them. So now the child is the centerpiece. Children in Jesus' day were kind of like meant to not be seen or heard a whole lot. They didn't have much in the way of status at all within, within society. Jesus takes one of these little children. And by the way, children like to be with Jesus. That says a lot. It says a lot. Jesus was a safe person to be around. He places a child among them, and then he says, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is, listen to these words, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine kind of like one of those head scratcher moments for the disciples? Like, did you hear what I thought I heard? Did he just say the position of a child is the greatest? Some things just pew, pew, go right over. Humility. Humility. Simplicity. When someone's hurt, they care about each other. They help each other. Sometimes they even share. Jesus says these are the traits that make one great in the kingdom of heaven. Not power, prestige, position, privilege. No. Not according to God. Back to Matthew chapter 20. In verses 22 and 23... You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? Sometimes the cup could be uh, referenced to a position of power, like extending privilege to someone. They are entering into a position, they receive the cup. But as Jesus talks about a cup here, and as we look at what is about to happen in Jesus' life, we recognize that Jesus is not talking about some grand position of power. When he says, are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink of, we, we remember what he says in the garden. Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. What is he talking about? The cross. Jesus says, are you able to drink this cup that I am going to drink? To their credit, they didn't understand, but they're eager. Of course we can. And there are these moments that happen, and this is one of them, where Jesus, he sees he sees down the line. He sees what's going to happen to these two brothers, and he says these words, you will indeed drink from my cup. Christian tradition tells us that James was the first of the apostles to be martyred. Cross before crown. And James, at that moment, was not about to give up anything related to Jesus for any position of power. He was content to be a follower of Jesus, regardless of the cost. John, what happened to John? Some of... Uh, Christian history and tradition tells us that John was, uh, they, they tried to kill John and were unsuccessful. And so they banish him to a small island, the island of Patmos, which is where John spent a significant period of time writing things down like maybe the book of Revelation. Isolation. For some people, almost worse than death. Isolation. 
These are the things that happened to these two brothers. Jesus said, you will indeed drink my cup. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Verse 24. James and John are just two out of 12 men who walk and live with Jesus, who all are desiring the same kinds of things. And so some of them begin to overhear this conversation. And I'm sure that this is how the text went. They came with great concern for James and John, and they took them aside and they said, oh, wait a second, James, John, this is not how the kingdom of God works. It's not about position. It's not about prestige. It's not about privilege. In the kingdom of God, the things that really matter are humility and simplicity and service. And, and you're not displaying that right now, and we want to help you find your way. That's what we do when someone else beats us to the punch, right? When they get the position ahead of us. Maybe I read a different translation. Verse 24, when the ten heard about this, they were, what does your translation say? Indignant, greatly displeased. Was this because the law of egalitarianism had been broken? Was it because James and John wanted something that, oh, no, 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 we can't want that. That's not good. Or was it FOMO? Wait a second. That's what all of us want. And you got there ahead of us. Indignation. You know what another word for that is? Jealousy. I'm sure you've never felt that emotion. Someone else beat us to it and they are maybe going to take the spot that we want. Every one of those other disciples had the same longing that James and John did. James and John just got there first. That's why everybody else is so upset. Because they beat them to it. This is not one great big loving happy family at this moment in time where we just all are here to support each other and oh wow you got this great position we're so happy for you it's excuse me I want that now you can imagine this has been I mean we're getting close to three and a half years in Jesus ministry they have lived worked Listen to Jesus for some of them almost three and a half years, some of them slightly less than that, but they've been with Jesus day in and day out most of the time for that period of time. And this is where they are at the close of Jesus' ministry almost. They're still after power and prestige and privilege. Now, how do you think Jesus feels at this moment? He's on the eve, if you will. It's getting close where his ministry is about to wind down. He is going to be stretched out on a cross as the sacrifice for the sins of the world. And the church is going to have to go forward. And it's going to have to go forward with this group of people. And this is where they are. How confident would you feel right about now? Not very. I probably would have been tempted to have a strong lecture at this moment in time. Jesus never misses an opportunity to share once again what is ultimately important. And so he takes this moment to remind them of what ultimately matters in God's kingdom. Let's listen to it. Jesus called them together and said, 
you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. In the text, this is not one of those situations that Jesus is berating the structures of the world. That's not how the text actually reads. It is simply a statement of fact. This is how it is in the world. This is how governments operate. This is how organizations operate in this world. There are structures. There are tiers. There are positions. There's authority. People do what they're told. And sometimes if they don't, they get demoted. That's how it works. You're very familiar with that structure. Verse 26, not so with you. The structures that you're familiar with, those are structures that can't be brought over and incorporated into the kingdom of God because they're based on power and privilege and prestige oftentimes, and those are not the things that matter in God's kingdom. So Jesus is telling them this whole thing that is about to happen is the church is going to go forward. You can't bring those kinds of structures into this. The relationships within the church are meant to be different. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become, what's the word? Great. It's the thing that they all longed for. Not so with you. But instead, whoever wants to be great, Jesus says, must be your servant. It's another one of those head scratch moments. Really? The word in the original is diakono. Diakonos is, uh, is that word that relates to deacon or minister, as we read about it in the New Testament. And it is a word that represents someone who serves, uh, whether it is for men, whether it is for women. That word had various gender uh, de designations to it. We have deacons and deaconesses within the New Testament. Regardless... The word signifies someone who serves. It's interesting to me that in today's modern church, we have taken the word for minister and we have turned it into a position of power because that's how we think and that's how we function. A minister has authority because they're the minister. Jesus says, minister was a servant. That's the idea that was behind that word. Someone who serves, who helps other people. Jesus says, if you want to be great, don't seek a title. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, don't seek for a position because it has some bearing of authority and power to it. Seek to care for and serve other people. And God will see that and he will mark you as someone of greatness in his kingdom. Unless the disciples should miss this, he goes on further. And whoever wants to be first, which is what they all wanted, must be your slave, doulas. Your slave. These two expressions in the ancient world kind of bring up the idea of humility and service, servanthood. And in the ancient world in which Jesus spoke these words, those were two character traits that were actually looked down upon. That was seen as weakness, humility, service. Those were not things to emulate. Because that would designate you as someone in a low position. Everyone wanted to have a high position. So those were things you didn't want to touch. 
You wanted to be seen as somebody. That means somebody else is supposed to serve you. Don't serve somebody else. That's the world in which Jesus is speaking. And those are the things that are rolling around inside of these disciples' minds and hearts. And Jesus says, if you want to be great, if you want to be first, which I know you do, you've got to turn this whole thing on its head because greatness in God's kingdom is humility and service. It's not power. It's not prestige. It's not privilege. God and his ways are different. And that's why you can't take those structures and bring them in and find that it represents God. Because the person who is greatest is the person who serves. Are there going to be positions within the kingdom of God as we operate here in this world? Yes, there will be. But is it about power? No. Position means a greater opportunity to serve. And if we don't get that right, we will get nowhere. The church will get nowhere. Authority is not something that is just bestowed because you have a title. Authority is something that comes through character. If you want to have influence, have character. Serve other people. And God will mark you and say, that's, oh, that's one of the great ones. They have their priorities right. And then Jesus says these words, verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus does not ask them to live out something that he has not lived out. Everything that Jesus tells them is how he has lived his life. Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, in the story that basically mirrors this one, who's the greatest, the person who sits at the table or the one who serves? Oh, that's easy. It's the one who sits at the table. That's what all of us want to be. We want to be the person at the table, somebody else serving us. Jesus says, and I am here as one who serves. I'm not expecting everybody else to come and serve me, even though if anybody had the right for that, it was him. I'm here as one who serves. And he lives his life as an object lesson of how he intends us to live ours. And that is where true greatness is found. John never forgot these words, even though it took a little while for him to get that inside of his head and inside of his heart and to find that it was transformed so that he could actually live this way. And here's the other thing. Why does Jesus live as a servant? Is it out of duty and obligation and because that's what's demanded and expected or is it out of love? It's the latter. That's what motivates Jesus to serve. And so his call to us today is not duty and obligation and gritting our teeth, but to allow him to so transform us that service becomes the response of love because his love is inside of us, enabling us to love other people and to serve them as Jesus does. These words from John, four applications, we're done. John writes this towards the end of his life in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 and 16. For this is the message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Did John finally get it? Yes. Yes, he did. 
He discovered what true greatness really was. And he was able to communicate that to the church of his day. Okay, a couple of things here. Applications. The church is not to be like other institutions in how people relate to each other. Position is not about power or privilege, but about character and greater opportunities to serve others. That's how things are meant to work. Number two, greatness, according to God, is seen in our ability to serve others from a heart of love, not in titles of perceived importance. Number three, the crown will come when God's kingdom is fully restored at the end of all things, but until then, there is a cross to bear, and it is unique to each one of us. And the day when the crown does come, I think some of us might be surprised at the people with the bigger crown because it won't be like it is here. It'll be different. And thankfully, in that day, it won't even matter. Fourth and finally, Some of you will appreciate what I am about to say, and some of you may scratch your head, but I will say it anyway. Privilege in our social location is meant to be leveraged for the good of our fellow human beings, not to advance our own interests only. And if you or I have it by no fault or choice of our own, use it for the good of all. And I'll close with these words from a book that's familiar to most of you. Desire of Ages, page 550. The author states this. Christ was establishing a kingdom on different principles. He called men, and can I say by extension women, not to authority, but to service. The strong to bear the infirmities of the weak. Power, position, talent, education placed their possessor under the greater obligation to serve his fellows. If you have been blessed with any of these things that in our world are considered identifications of privilege, Leverage them for the good of other people and you will find joy. And on the day when Jesus will come, he will point to you and he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words recorded for us to remind us of what true greatness means in your kingdom. And God, we recognize that within our own hearts sometimes there are competing elements here. Of course, there is love for you. And at times, there's a longing for position for recognition, for privilege. And God, we ask that you will so work within us that these things will lose their power over us so that we might finally find joy in serving. Thank you knowing that you are completely able to do this. And we ask it in the name of our Savior Jesus, who showed us the way.